Hello, and welcome to Episode 4 of the Explosive Strength Podcast with Jared Bidney. In today's episode, I'm going to talk about why we box squat, how we set it up, and how people do not care about results. When listening to my podcast, you have to pay attention to my context. When I talk about stuff that has to do with athletic performance, not what you read in a fitness or personal training journal, book, magazine, I don't care. I am doing what it takes to get these athletes to improve in their jumping, their running speed, and their strength. And I'm not into CrossFit, fitness, or fads. You have to find you. So just because you listen to this stuff does not mean, and if you're a bodybuilder, it may not directly relate to you. So you can't say it does or does not work. Everything does work, depending on which purpose you want it for. Okay. You got to think about this. Strength training is like a recipe. You have to have skill and, and a physical ability to perform that skill. You cannot go just work on your skill all the time and expect to make it. You cannot just work on your physical ability all the time and expect to make it. A lot of people have gone in the past and you kind of get the old meathead type mentality. Hey, just because he's strong, don't mean he's going to be a good football player. No, he's gaining strength to be a better football player. It is the coach's responsibility to teach that athlete the skill to become a better football player. I think coaches don't coach. Coaches take the best and they play with them. They're not teaching skill like they should. You know, you're giving them the physical ability to run faster, to jump higher, to move. They need to be working on a lot more skill. They, they go to football practice and they just work on plays. They're not teaching them like they should. Okay, enough of that rant. The, um, so, in other words, you got to have skill and a physical ability. If you're just going to, working on baseball year-round and you're not working on your physical ability, don't expect your 60-yard time to get better. Don't expect your swing speed to increase after it reaches a plateau because it's not. Some things are technically related, but once the technique is perfected, the strength is going to be the limiting factor that holds you back. Okay, let's talk about box squats and why we box squat before I kind of get off on more tangents. Um, we use the box squat because it has a direct correlation to 40 yard times, okay? And people see that we're squatting, they have no clue why we're squatting on the box. The box, we use the box as a tool, not a guide, which means we actually sit on the box. We don't touch and go. A lot of people you'll see or have in the past, they just use, hey, he's just using the box to make sure they get the right depth. No, I'm using it to break up the eccentric concentric chain, which helps create more explosive power. So we use the box as a tool, not a guide, okay? We're using the box squat to squat, we're using a static dynamic method. The static dynamic method is a reactive method, also known as a contrast method. These methods develop power and explosive strength by imposing specific demands on the nervous system. Okay, so we're doing exercises, but we are also using methods behind our exercises to have a greater effectiveness of what we do. Using a static dynamic method, we're able to develop absolute strength and explosive power at the same time, okay? By sitting on the box and breaking up the eccentric concentric chain causes our motor neurons to, high, to fire at a higher discharge frequency. And over time, more neurons connect to the tissue making it stronger. So you got to think of this like tug of war. The more men I get on the other side of the rope, the more power I'm going to have. So as you're working on your nervous system, if you take your hand and you got five fingers and you put it on the table, but you only touch two fingers to the table. All right. Over time, you're touched the third finger over time, fourth finger and fifth finger. So your hand is kind of like almost like the motor neuron. So your fingers are the ones that are actually tie into the muscle tissue, causing that muscle to shorten and contract. And the more I train those nerves to fire and adhere to that tissue, the faster and stronger that muscle can contract. So that's what we're doing by using the static dynamic method, we're allowing our nervous system to adapt to that tissue, okay? Then over time, as, as we get those neurons to go, we do have to use other exercises to increase the size of that fiber because if our rope is too small and we get too many people pulling on that rope, the rope will break. So we do have to work on neuromuscular development and muscular development at the same time. 
Um, I may try to go just straight up neuromuscular for a while, then maybe add in some hypertrophy work to make sure that tissue grows so that the contractile units do not get too strong and disrupt our muscle system, okay? Strength is not primarily a function of size, but one of the appropriate muscles powerfully contracted by the effectiveness of the nervous stimulation, which means when we are training here is the same thing I just told you about the tug of war thing. We are training for functional ability, which means all I do is care about how many neurons, how are we functioning? Like a bodybuilder, they do structural resistance training. We do functional. It's not standing on a unbalanced ball, that's not functional training. Functional training is getting the appropriate muscles to fire at the appropriate discharge frequency, okay? Bodybuilders are not concerned with that. They're concerned about growth of the muscle tissue. And I don't know a whole lot about hypertrophy training or muscular growth. I do know how to create results with what we do here, but Lee Haney, bodybuilders, John Meadows, and people like that, those are your go-to guys for uh, muscle tissue training. And just because it's a big muscle does not mean it's necessarily a strong muscle. And just because a muscle is small does not mean necessarily mean it's a weak muscle. It's basically functional strength versus structural strength. Kind of like all right, bodybuilders, we use the same tools. We use the barbell, we use dumbbells, but we do a different job, okay? And I just explained the science behind the box, what, what it does, how it does. Now let's look at some of the results that we've gotten with box squats, okay? I'm going to talk about a girl here. You got to think, when I'm telling these results, we are using complete laser, laser hand start. No human interaction with our timing system. That way I precisely measure every one per month with the exact same devices, the exact same distance on the exact same surface. I'm not switching surfaces. I'm not going outside where you got a windy day, high humidity, low humidity, temperature changes. We are inside, we're running on a completely electrical system. And when people come here, I run a 4.8. Okay, let's see it. They run a 5.1. Oh, BS, that's wrong. No, you're just really that slow because when you're outside under different circumstances using a stopwatch with different coaches, you're gonna get different results, okay? Just like at the NFL Combine, they're inside. They run the 40-yard dash at the same facility. You're in, you're out, and they use the same laser timing system. That way their stuff's consistent. And that way you'll see some guys, that they think they're running faster. You say, man, I thought he was faster than that. Well, they go to their pro day with their handheld time. They're going to have a better time. Um, some journals, almost 0.25 difference. So that's the difference between a um, 4.40 and a 4.65, you know. So it depends on where you are and what you're doing. Okay, anyway, so when, when I hear these numbers, if they sound if I have a kid that runs a 4.7, he's probably going to go somewhere and get time to 4.5 or 4.4, okay. So let's just get that out of the way because you don't know unless you've been tested on it. So don't think you know. All right, let's talk about this girl. Her, she ran a 7.8, month one. Month two, she ran a 7.7. Seven. Month three, she ran a 7.3, then a 7.2, then a 6.8, then a 7. Hmm, she went up, then a 7.1, then back down to a 6.9. Okay, these are month after month. When the athletes come here, I test the 40-yard dash every month. I expect one-tenth of a second improvement per month per athlete if they're doing what I ask, okay? So she went from a 7.8 to a 7.7 to a 7.3 to a 7.2 to a 6.8. Those are pretty quick results, okay? For those months of continual improvement, she box squatted. The one, two, three, four, fifth month, we decided to go to regular squat. I use regular squat to build structure and my athletes, um, that way I was talking about where you have the more neuromuscular, then you got to go to structural. So I was trying to build some structure. So as our nervous system got stronger pulling that fiber, we were not going to have any fiber issues later on. Okay. So here we go. So she went from um, six, eight to a seven. Once she went back up in running speed, her running speed slowed down by almost two tenths of a second. We switched to regular squat. 
The next month, she ran a 7-1. That's two months in a row regular squat. Then the next month, she ran a 6-9 going back to box squats. Okay, so that should show you as she did box squats, she was improving month after month after month. We switched her squat because we had to take care of her structure. And she kind of slowed down a little bit, but when we went back to squat, box squat, we kind of got our results back. So when people come here, they have to be here long enough in order for me to get a result. Then once something does not click or happen right, I've got to change, and you've got to be willing to go through change, although you're not getting what you think you are until the end, you know? All right, look at this guy. January, February, March, April, May, and June. Okay. This kid's been here for a while. His first month, I just tried to get the best out of him because he was going to a speed training facility for maybe a year, year and a half before he came to me. Um, the reason he came to me is because this kid was going, these, these are baseball players, so let's, let's talk about the 60-yard dash. They were going to these showcases weekend after weekend, month after month. And the one kid that was coming here went from a 7-2, 60-yard dash to a 6-7-60 yard dash. 6-7-60 yard dash for a baseball player scholarship material. Okay. And so they were going and both kids were going to the speed place. But one of them was going to speed place and coming here. But the one that was improving was coming here and there. So he was doing both. And the dad of the other kid, the kid ran a 7-2 for a solid year. So obviously speed training don't work. So he ran a 7-2 for a year, and he said, what the heck is this kid doing? And so um, he found out that the other kid was coming here. Well, this kid stopped going to the speed place, and he went to the real speed place because strength is speed. <laughs> and once people get that through their head, we'll be a lot better off because it's not what people think. Okay. So anyway, let's get that out of the way. This kid started coming here, and I was trying to prove a point to his dad. Okay. So his and I tested this kid four times the first time. He ran a 5.35, a 5.46, a 5.49, and a 5.36. So his best time was a 5.35. He had a 24-inch vertical, okay? Um, he had a box squat of 205. So I try to track as much as I can. First month, 5.35. Second month, a 5.25. Third month, a 5.17. Fourth month, a 5.01. Fifth, a 486 and a 490. So the slowest he ran was a 490 by that point. The next month, he ran a 4.77 and a 4.81. So even at that 4.81 of that latter month, it was still faster than his 4.86. So his box and his vertical jump went from a 24.8 to a 34.0. So that's 53, 52, 51, 5 flat, 48. Four, seven. This kid only box squatted and box squatted only because I was trying to prove a point. We had to get that 60-yard time down before summer before you started going to uh, the showcases to make sure. Okay, that's his 40-yard dash improvement from a 5-3 to a 4-7. And his 60-yard dash went from a 7-2 to a 6-6. Six, six. All right, once he hit that, he started getting calls and offers uh, to play baseball. So... His whole point, he had to have that running speed to get better, okay? What did he do? He box squat or box squatted. I don't care, okay? Now look at this other kid. Month one, five, two. Month two, five, one. Then a four, nine, three, and then a four, nine, six. All right, so that's two months in a row where he ran a four, nine. He ran a five, two, five, one. He skipped a five flat and jumped straight to a four, nine, then a four, nine, two months in a row. I'm trying to average a tenth of a second off per month. Sometimes when you get a bigger change than what's expected, you may have two months where your running speed's the same because you got to let those adaptations settle in. Your body, once it changes too fast, it goes, hold on, what's going on here? We need to slow down. I need to think about this. Oh, okay. Then the body releases. Then you get another result. So that's kind of how that works, okay? Another kid, he ran a 5-1. Uh, on the second month, he did not test because his leg was injured. Then the third month, he ran a 4.9. Then 
Then he ran a 4.87. Then he ran a 4.81. Hopefully this next month we get him down to a 4.7. So, uh, again, a month after month improvement on that kid. So let's see if he skipped 5.1. Nope. Oh, yeah, he skipped. He went 5-1, 4-9, 4-8, 4-8. So that's good. All right, let's go with this other kid. Uh, this kid also started off at a 5-1 and went to a 5-0-5, 4-9, then a 4-8-6. So within a few months, he also went from a 31 to a 35 and a half inch vertical. Uh, look at this kid. <laughs> this is funny. This, uh, this parent of this kid came to me and said, um, Hey, Jared, he needs to get faster. He needs to get faster. Just because you look at a kid and he, and he don't look any faster does not mean he's not any faster. You know, like when you see someone every day, sometimes you don't even notice that they change. So if you're always watching your kid play or whatever, what you should do is if, if your kid goes to a gym, I don't care if he goes here or wherever, drop the kid off, don't pay attention, pick him up a couple months later, then you can see stuff. If you'd quit hovering over the kid, you would notice the change is much greater than – just to graduate, all of a sudden you got a, a three-year-old, then he's 10. And you look back, oh, I forgot how small he was. That's the same thing that's happening with these athletic results. If you're, if you're hovering over your kid a lot, you don't really see that change. But anyway, so Jared, he's got to get faster. Okay, well, I'll pull out the photo. Okay, this kid went from a 6-0 to a 5-6 to a 5-5 to a 5-4 to a 5-3. So that's pretty huge this was from november to uh april all right he went from a 20.5 to a 31.5 uh vertical jump and i test the vertical running speed um every month you know sometimes if their vertical jump goes up and their running speed does not change like you got that one kid that ran a four nine two months in a row vertical went up all right so there's some under if the vertical is going up there's some underlining changes letting you know something's happening they're just not displaying themselves yet you know like that whole thing with okay hold up what's what's going on then letting it go that's what the body does the body is very smart it does not want to change so you have to change it okay and let's talk about this girl this girl she went from a 64 63 61 Six two six one five nine five eight. Okay, and so with consistency, you see that she went from a six two to a six six one to a six two, back to a six one, then down to a five nine, then down to a five eight. Sometimes that also depends on their training frequency of those months. I'm trying to at least get them squat a minimum of two times per week. Okay. So that's some of the results that we've gotten. You can hear the changes, 5-3 um, to a 4-7, 5-1, 4-9, 4-8, 4-8, 4-8, 4-8, 4-8, 4-8, 4-8, 4-8, 4-8, 4-8, 4-8, 4-8, 4-8, 4-8, 4-8, 4-8, 4-
why are they coming out like they walked in? You know, minimum effective dosage. You know, if I can get away with just box squatting only, and we don't have to do a lot of accessory exercises from some kids, we're just going to box squat. They're coming here to get a result. I'm showing results. Okay. If you think a result is the kid coming out puking, the kid coming out about to pass out, drenched in sweat, that's a workout. That's not a training. Okay, so you're here to train. We're going after a specific adaptation. Okay, if you want to go work out, you go somewhere else. Okay, speaking of going somewhere else and working out, I got this one kid right here. All he wants, Jared, I got to get faster. He was going to be a walk on at a Division I school, and he was a running back in high school, and he wanted to get faster. Jared, I need to get faster. I need this. I need to get stronger. Okay. Well, let's work on that. Okay. He came in. He ran a 5.10 and a 5.11 with a 10-yard dash of a 1.83. If you're running back, you better get to that A gap or B gap real quick. Okay. So, uh, month one, ran a 5.1. Month two, ran a five zero. Month three, ran a four nine. Okay. His 10 yard dash went from a one eight three to a one six eight. He went from a one eight three one month to a one seven seven, then a one six eight. So I got him faster, longer distance for his 40. Also, shorter sprint time is 10 yard dash, which is very applicable to his sport as a running back. Okay. So then his bench press went from 265 to 315. All right. He's faster. He's stronger. Um, then all of a sudden I ask, hey, where's this kid at? Well, they look at me and I said, hmm. He, he's just going down the street uh, to this other place to work out because he wants to do workouts like what he's going to do at college. Okay. I said, okay. He said, well, because there's a guy there that used to be an assistant there, so he kind of knows what they do. I said, Fair enough, but he wanted to get faster and he wanted to get stronger and not do a workout. I mean, that's aggravating. You get a kid, you're giving them exactly what they want, and they go somewhere else because they want a workout. You know, then the other place don't even test. <laughs> that makes me so mad. I'm giving, I'm even showing it. They got everybody that comes here has a folder, and in the back of that folder is their monthly progress. Okay, so when a kid comes here, we program them I rate their workout based on their last workout okay if I want you to squat 315 at 0.63 meters per second that's what we're going to work at you know some kids have moved all right let's okay results that kid got results went somewhere else because he wanted a workout not a training thing so pisses me off that's aggravating okay so you go get your workout somewhere else, let, leave the training to me. And so what's going to happen eventually, I'm just going to have like-minded people around, you know, and if you don't like getting results, if you don't want to help me help you, get out. Okay, where was I going to go with that? All right. I had this guy we had to train to get into the NFL. Zach Lasky, I don't care. He may care. I don't care. I'm going to use his name. He came here January 10th. Um, I don't have his folder out, so I can't exactly call exact progressions. But he was in the 4-7 range of his 40-yard dash. He is moving 315 at 0.6 meters per second. Uh, we do all of our squat testing. Uh, once we develop and I get you to where I want you to, then you're squatting with a tendo, which means I'm going to monitor your bar speed. So Lasky had to get that 40 yard dash time. Uh, he was a um, running back at Georgia Tech. They said he did not have a shot. He was gonna run a four seven or a four eight, you know, and uh, he was going as a running back into the draft. And if he runs a four seven or a four eight, he ain't going to the league. <laughs> so my job again was to get him from point A to point B. He was moving and let's go, I'll just let you know how we did it. He was moving 315 at 0.6 meters per second at 215 pounds. 215, 218, I think it was 218, um, which was, I think, 1.4 times his body weight. 
if I can recall. Then we got him moving. So we went from 315, moving 315 at 0.6 meters per second to moving 405 at 0.6 meters per second. I think he actually moved at 405 at 0.61. And his body weight went to 230, 235, whatever it was. It was 1.72 times his body weight at that time. So we got him to move 1.72 times his body weight on that squat bar, the same speed he used to move 1.4 times his body weight. So that means what I did was I increased his relative strength. Now, whatever your squat is divided by your body weight, that gives you that one point something, okay, or 2.0 or wherever you are in relative strength. So what I did is I got him to move a higher relative percentage of his body weight on the bar at a faster rate of speed. That's how we got faster, okay? Um, we sit and explode, you know, it's just static dynamic. We're causing more of a neuromuscular, a neuromuscular demand on our body to help us get those explosive adaptations. You know, we are explosive mechanics. Uh, we're not implosive. We're not turtles. Um, so that's how we did it. Okay. Now let's talk about how I set the box up. Everybody that comes here, if they're six one or under, the box is twelve inches plus a six inch blue foam pad. So when you sit on that blue foam pad, you sink in. It's kind of like if you're sitting on a wooden chair and you stand up using no arms versus sitting on your couch where you sink in, then you stand up using no arms, it's harder. So I am demanding the most out of the nervous system as I possibly can. Our boxes are set up at 12 inches with that six inch blue foam pad. With that, if you're 6'2 or higher, you get a notch up on the box. If you're 6'7 or 6'9, I had two kids that were 6'7 and 6'9 in the gym. They had three or four inches, depending on their shin, depending on how long their shin is or the lower leg. Then you have to specifically adjust the box to them or what they look like. Um, we don't use a wide stance with it. Our stance is more narrow. And we look for specific speeds on the tendo unit before their weights are waved or changed around. So if anybody has any questions on that, um, I don't know if I covered everything I wanted to. I know I didn't ramble on a whole lot. I talked about how it was um, strength training is a recipe. You gotta figure it out. You know, if I need more sugar or more butter or flour or whatever. If I don't have the right, if I don't have eggs, if I don't have sugar, my cookies are not going to be very well. So you don't want to screw up that recipe. And so then if you think that you can go in your garage and you can copy or emulate what I do when you're not knowing how the body works or responds to specific things, go ahead. You know, um, I've had some young athletes leave cause their parents have enough money to go buy them a squat rack and a bench. Um, and they just work out at home. Hmm. Well, years later, kid has no motivation to go to the garage, do not want to listen to the parent, and therefore the kid's the same, or they burn out, okay? Enough on that. Um, also, for parents, you've got to give time for change, you know? Uh, like I said, some people will come in. Uh, I had a basketball player. He went from a 1.9 to a 1.6, 10 yard dash, and his dad said he was slower. Well, he appeared slower on the court. Well, was his competition faster than what he was dealing with? Who knows the outside circumstances? But you can show the exact changes on paper. You know, then some, okay, for those of you who don't know this either, we do not spend a lot of time on technique of running the 40-yard dash. Our 40-yard, we're not spending hours on end going over technique. We are getting stronger. We're getting stronger, and we're getting stronger more in a neuromuscular aspect, causing a higher demand on our nervous system to cause greater contraction speeds of our muscles so that our body can move faster, okay? So the kid, and once I showed his dad that, oh, and his vertical jump went up five inches. Oh, I didn't notice him he was jumping higher. What, well, geez, you know? You can't go somewhere and think something. You need to write it down. So if you got someone training you, or you're working out somewhere and you're not monitoring your progress, if you're not tracking what you did from point A to point B or wherever you're going, 
you're not training, you're sitting there spinning your wheels because you can't figure out what's happening because you don't know what's happening because you're not taking the notes. Okay? So uh, I think that's going to be it for our box squat episode. People don't care about results. You know, you get people that come in here, um, will get, leave because they think they're not getting it, but it's on the back of the kid's folder that they're getting it. I don't know what they're not getting. Um, so if anyone would like to give me that answer, I would greatly appreciate it. Um, you know, strength's not always king. You got to have skill. So those with both win the most, okay? Now, you do have some genetic freaks out there that can come out, run a 4.5 or 4.6 on laser and never be strength trained before. Those are the people you're trying to catch. If you don't have it, you got to go get it, you know? So in general, if you're weak, you're slow. You could take, I've been to powerlifting meets where I've seen running backs walk out with 455 pounds on their back, not very stable with the bar. You could tell someone who's not squatted very much. They don't have the structure to really stand, but boom, man, they can dip down and stand back up with that 455. They may not have a whole lot of uh, control over it, but they got the strength. Now you got to harness that power. Why do you think Nick Chubb and all those people at University of Georgia squat 600 pounds? Ben Johnson was a 600-pound squatter. And, and for a little tidbit of information, your average Olympic sprinter squats 2.5 times your body weight. You know, if you look at your sprinters versus your distance runners, your sprinters got some big, thick thighs, and they are strong. Bolt spends a lot of his time in the weight room, but you don't see as weight room stuff you see his track stuff okay he's a track star so of course you're gonna see his track stuff what the hell is he doing in the weight room he's getting stronger so he can run faster so that's what he's doing he spends uh, I think about 80 percent of his time in the weight room the other 20 percent perfecting his skill so once you have skill or once you have technique you need to work on what you don't have is with your physical ability just like what me and Ben talked about and uh, episode two with his baseball pitching. Then we talked about how strength was important for Ryan. Ryan was very strong, but he moved the bar at a very slow rate of speed. So we didn't continue to get stronger. We got faster with heavier weight. Um, and that had a direct impact on his shot put. He won two state champ, champs, uh, championships back to back in high school, broke the college record when he got there, turned around as a sophomore, broke his freshman record. That's continual progress. Okay. So if you're not marking or figuring out what you're doing you don't have continual progress so um enough for that anyway please follow me at jaredbidney.com for my website explosive mechanics on instagram uh explosive mec on twitter for now have a good night and uh thanks for listening